Good afternoon, and welcome to another CAMERA webinar. I'm Andrea Levin, Executive Director of CAMERA. Thank you for joining us, and thank you to all who support our work. You know, we assume today's topic, New York Times bias against Israel, would be of interest, but we're very impressed at how many of you are joining us today. Nearly 1,000 people have pre-registered. And that speaks to how very much this important institution troubles a large segment of the public, especially those who know something about Israel's challenges and do not find that reality presented factually and fully in this very influential publication. On the contrary, today we'll look at some of the background of the family-owned newspaper, as well as issues in recent coverage. We will also continuously emphasize that action to counter falsehoods and bias is imperative and effective. Before introducing our speakers, I want to alert you to two upcoming camera webinars this month, and there are many others as well scheduled this summer. On June 18th, we're presenting a wonderful young journalist from the Jerusalem Post, Lahav Harkov, who will update us on the contentious issue of China and Israel. On June 25th, Steve Stotsky, our specialist on school curricula issues, will present important information on how Israel is depicted in our schools now. And now I am very proud to introduce today's speakers, two distinguished members of CAMERA's senior analyst staff, Ricky Hollander and Gilad Aini, who together produced a seminal study of the time several years ago and have written extensively about the newspaper. Both Ricky and Gilad were trained in the sciences as were a number of our a number of our uh, analysts. Ricky was educated at Hebrew University and McGill University in biochemical genetic and epidemiology research, as well as publishing in the wider media. She's published many invaluable backgrounders for camera on subjects such as Jerusalem and the Temple Mount. Recently, she published in-depth articles on Jewish Voice for Peace and on BDS. Galad, who has a degree from the University of Delaware in environmental science, has published extensively on the media, including in Commentary Magazine, and he has a, a, an article in the upcoming issue. The New York Post, Christian Science Monitor, and elsewhere. He too has produced in-depth studies that have had significant impact, including his documenting of the facts in a creative multimedia timeline of Jeremy Corbyn's anti-Semitism that was widely cited internationally. I encourage you all to visit our website to see all that's being done regarding the US, UK, Spanish, Hebrew, and Arabic media. And so now to our program, what Ricky will begin, then Gilad. Uh, we'll take written questions afterwards. If you move your cursor along the bottom of your screen, you'll see an icon for Q&A. Please submit your questions while the lecture is underway and we'll take as many as we can and thank you again so much for being with us. And now, Ricky Hollander. Thank you, Andrea. And thanks to all of you who are joining, joining us today. <clears throat> for more than a century, the New York Times was considered one of the most influential newspapers in the world, nicknamed the Gray Lady or dubbed the Newspaper of Record. <clears throat> I think it's losing some of that prestige as it tilts further and further toward a more extreme political worldview as we expose its frequent lapses from ethical journalism, and as more and more readers are becoming attuned to its bias. Our focus today is on the newspaper's long and complicated history with the Jewish nation and state. I'll start by discussing this history and explain how cameras monitoring and work in addressing New York Times bias serves to flatten the curve of anti-Israel reporting and anti-Zionism. My colleague Gilad Aini will then bring you up to date on our latest battles and successes regarding the newspaper. Many New York Times critics are aware that during the Holocaust, the newspaper deliberately downplayed news about Nazi persecution and the genocide of European Jews. Former Times executive editor Max Frankel acknowledged this much in a 2001 article where he lamented the staggering, staining failure of the newspaper to depict Hitler's methodical extermination of European Jewry, 
as a horror beyond all horrors of World War II. He considered this a result of then publisher Arthur Hayes Salzberger having gone to great lengths to avoid having the Times branded a Jewish newspaper. In 2005, Northeastern journalism professor Laura Leff wrote a book about the newspaper's shameful downplay of the Holocaust called Buried by the Times. She suggested the publisher avoided presenting Jews as Hitler's victims because he worried the newspaper might appear too Jewish if it focused on Jewish victims. But the truth is that the Times' troubled approach to covering Jewish topics, uh, in particular the Jewish national state, began decades before the Holocaust. A recent book by historian Gerald Orbach called Print to Fit, the New York Times, Zionism and Israel, traces this approach back to the purchase of the paper by Adolf Ox more than 120 years ago and demonstrates just how much a part of the newspaper's DNA is its antagonism toward the Jewish state. Ox was a first generation American, the son of Jewish immigrants from Bavaria, and he belonged to the American reform movement of Judaism. At the time, its prominent members and leaders, including Ox's own father-in-law, Rabbi Isaac Mayer Weiss, were staunch opponents of the modern Zionist movement. In 1896, Ox bought the 45-year-old New York Times. It was the same year that Theodore Herzl published Der Judenstaat, proposing the restoration of an independent Jewish state in the Jewish ancestral homeland as a solution to global anti-Semitism. The newspaper's coverage of the reborn Jewish national movement was influenced by the assimilationist ideology of the type of reform Judaism that Ox embraced. An attitude that considered Jewish nationalism in the Holy Land not only impractical, but undesirable. According to this ideology, America was the promised land for Jews. The Times offered a frequent platform for critics of Zionism and the newspaper's editorial policy echo echoed its uh, publisher's rejection of Jewish nationhood. Adolf Ox's son-in-law, Arthur Hayes Salzberger, who I just mentioned, had succeeded him as publisher of the New York Times. He shared his father-in-law's views of Zionism and his perception of Judaism as divorced from nationhood. I do not believe Jews are a race. I do not believe they are a people, he's quoted as saying, expressing his view that Jewish adversity should not be overly emphasized. Even after the newspaper's abysmal failure to cover the Holocaust adequately, he faulted Zionists for focusing on the plight of Jewish refugees rather than on all people who were displaced during the war. Salzberger served as publisher from 1935 to 1961, and throughout his tenure, he remained determined to prevent the Times from being dismissed as a Jewish paper. He was concerned that those appointed to senior editorial positions not have names that sounded overly Jewish, and editors were told not to refer to the Jewish people, but to people of the Jewish faith. Salzberger's son-in-law, Orville Dreyfus, took over as publisher in 1961, but passed away just two years later and was succeeded by Arthur's son, Arthur Ox Salzberger, known as Punch. With anti-Semitism in that period on the wane, Punch seemed less concerned with Jewish sounding names. Still, the newspaper's editorial approach regarding the Jewish state did not change significantly. As late as the mid-1980s, there was still a tacit editorial understanding that Israel would not be described as a Jewish state in the newspaper. By the time Punch's son, Arthur Ox Salzberger Jr., took over from his father in 1992, the publishing dynasty was no longer Jewish, Salzberger Jr. having been raised in his Episcopalian mother's faith. In 2017, he handed the reins over to his son, Arthur Greg Salzberger, who became the sixth member and fifth generation of the same family to control the New York Times. The Ox and Salzberger families' unease with Jewish nationhood and uh, a Jewish state influenced the ethos of the newspaper in the past. And this institutional mindset has endured to a lesser or greater extent throughout the years. 
often under the guise of espousing progressive and liberal mores. It influences both the editorial line and news coverage. It's conveyed through emphasis on Israel's critics who are presented neutrally and dismissal of supporters who are presented as partisan and extreme. It's expressed by focusing on the Jewish military's defensive actions while downplaying Palestinian terrorism and incitement and by treating Palestinians as victims without agency or responsibility for the ongoing conflict. Now that's not to say that during the newspaper's long history, there have never been any accurate and impartial articles about Israel or that commentary on the editorial pages exclusively condemns Israel. When the newspaper does report objectively and provides balanced coverage and when it reports accurately, we certainly do take note and we commend factual and candid reporting. But the problems I just mentioned appear in far too many news articles and columns to convince readers that institutional bias against the Jewish state no longer exists. Unless there's any lingering doubt that bias against the Jewish state is not intertwined with classic anti-Semitism, we need just recall last year's debacle at the newspaper when an overtly anti-Semitic cartoon was published on the op-ed um, op uh, page of the international edition. Here, I just uh, brought it up. It depicted a blind, keeper-wearing US president being led by the Israeli prime minister as a guide dog tagged with a Magen David. Uh, it was a familiar trope evoking Nazi imagery, Jews as subhumans controlling the world and directing its leaders. So you may ask whether there's any point to <clears throat> monitoring and following a newspaper with such a firmly entrenched bias? And the answer is a resounding yes. <clears throat> to see why it's so important, let's revisit the evolving response of editors to that cartoon. According to an anonymous staffer who spoke to CNN, the editors didn't even realize at first what a big deal this actually was, even after an initial outcry. <clears throat> Initially, <clears throat> they responded to the flood of criticism with a short editor's note acknowledging their error and publishing an offensive image, but without any apology or accountability. It was only after voices rose louder and louder in protest and to condemn the paper that they finally issued a real apology and committed themselves to ensuring it wouldn't happen again, followed by an apologetic editorial and an op-ed by their own columnist Brett Stevens, who called out their anti-Israel reporting as a precursor to the cartoon. <clears throat> the episode is ins instructive because it illustrates how thin the line is between classic anti-Semitism and bias against the Jewish nation. And it demonstrates the importance for us and for readers in getting editors to understand this. When condemnation of the Jewish state is so pervasive in the paper, when anti-Zionist commentary becomes so prevalent, so mainstream, that editors can no longer distinguish between valid criticism and anti-Semitism, it's imperative for us to raise the alarm. Not only against the most obvious examples of anti-Semitism like the cartoon, but about the problematic reporting that paves it, its way. <clears throat> and even if we don't manage to completely reverse the New York Times institutional culture of negativity toward the Jewish state, we can and we do counteract false information and unbalanced characterizations. Our approach at camera is four-pronged. One, to try to ensure that facts conveyed in news articles are correct and accurately worded. Two, to flatten the curve of defamatory coverage of the Jewish state. Three, to alert the public as to when and where the newspaper of record should not be trusted. And four, to be an authoritative source of reliable and accurate information that's missing from the New York Times. This requires systematic monitoring of the newspaper and website, as well as extensive research to ascertain the facts through primary sources and documents. When we find errors, we contact editors and reporters 
and ask them to correct or revise the article. And if and when they do correct, we make sure the error isn't repeated in another story or by a different journalist. An old but striking example is how reporting about UN Security Council Resolution 242 was changed. On several occasions, the paper had reported that the resolution required Israel to return to the 1967 lines, a falsehood that Palestinians routinely promote. In fact, the resolution's drafters clearly articulated that they did not intend for Israel to withdraw to its former insecure borders. So the first error flagged by camera claimed the resolution demanded an Israeli withdrawal from the entire West Bank and Gaza. We alerted editors and they corrected. Several weeks later, the error appeared again in a different form that suggested that according to 242, Israel was required to hand over all of East Jerusalem, including the Jewish quarter. Camera staff contacted the paper again and it was corrected again. And when we contacted them a few weeks later about yet a third iteration of the error, a third correction was published making it clear that no UN resolution required Israel to withdraw from all the territory it gained in 1967. At that point, the newspaper's then editor, Joseph Lelleveld, called a meeting with editors to ensure that the same falsehood would not be repeated again. And it hasn't recurred for nearly 20 years now. So even when we're forced to repeat the same complaint again and again, we know we can affect significant editorial changes at least regarding black and white errors. This is very, very important since so much of the media follows the Times lead. Correcting such a fundamental error has a vast ripple effect on wire services, newspapers, and electronic media globally. In this instance, reporting on uh, 242 has been largely accurate ever since, with camera invoking the model of the Times. Now, more difficult is combating the less direct bias in reporting, for example, stacking the decks against Israel by focusing disproportionately on denouncement by its critics. So document documentation in these cases requires a different approach, a quantitative one. And so we've un undertaken both small and large studies uh, using a metric approach to quantify the double standards. In 2011, we undertook the longest such study, a six month investigation of news and editorial content about the conflict during a relatively quiet period. Our results showed not only that focus on Israel and the conflict was intense even during that relatively quiet time, but that criticism of the Jewish state on whatever the topic that was being reported outweighed criticism of Palestinians by a factor of more than two. In other words, critics of Israel were cited or quoted more than twice as much as critics of Palestinians, and journalists underscored that criticism of Israel in their own voices more than twice as much as they did criticism of Palestinians. We alerted the public, and we met with editors at the newspaper to discuss the results of our study. Our documentation achieved two purposes, to demonstrate to readers the lack of reliable reporting, and to alert editors at the New York Times that readers expect more balanced and impartial reporting. We also routinely draw the public's attention to inappropriate editorialize, editorializing by news reporters who insert pejoratives to describe Israelis whose views they don't share. For example, Israeli Prime Minister Neta, uh, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu is uh, described as shrill, strident, abrasive, divisive, contentious, and cynical, as are other Israelis who express concern about is Iran's uh, nuclear ambitions or propose a tougher line on Palestinian terrorism. By contrast, Palestinian leader Mahmoud Abbas is described as conciliatory. And the anti-Semitic BDS movement has been described as a movement that's devoted to, uh, to opposing occupation of the West Bank. Now on BDS, we actually did succeed in getting an editor's clarification that noted that many D BDS supporters oppose Israel's existence as a Jewish state, although it failed to note that this applies even more so to BDS founders and leaders. <laughs> 
It's this regular demonstration of the newspaper's partisan reporting that has contributed to its loss of prestige. And our continual monitoring of facts that has resulted in corrections, clarifications, and even altered reporting. It's something we do and continue to do on a constant basis. And so I will now turn the screen over to Gila to bring you up to date on our latest challenges. Thank you so much, Ricky, for that uh, history, which is so illuminating and like so much history is really essential in understanding where we are today. And I also want to thank everyone who's joined us today. I wish I could say that it was good to see everyone's faces, but we're not quite there yet. Um, we got to keep everyone safe first and foremost. Uh, speaking of which, Ricky mentioned earlier that we're hard at work flattening the curve. And I actually want to run with that analogy for a minute because I, I think the coronavirus analogy works well, not just because it's timely, but because it's actually useful in visualizing the trends that we see over time when we're monitoring the media. Let me turn to my other monitor real quick and try to bring up a slide of that very thing. Um, yeah, so there's a the slide. So if you were to chart the health of the New York Times, and when I say that, what I mean is the degree to which the paper trends either in a positive direction toward its code of ethics or in a negative one toward advocacy journalism. Over long stretches of time, those trends also zig and zag almost like a pandemic chart. And in the same way, built-in variables like age, population density, weather might modulate a COVID outbreak. We can also say that the identity of editors, of bureau chiefs, or the fashionable view of what journalism should be can give us stretches of better coverage and stretches of worse coverage. And so if you charted it, it might look something like this graph of uh, coronavirus cases in Massachusetts. Over the course of many years, reporting gets somewhat worse. It gets a bit better, depending on who's in charge. More importantly though, as with the pandemic, we're not helpless in the face of those variables. We, the readers, can also influence the zigging and zagging with interventions. And those interventions keep the charts from going, for, for lack of a better term, off of the charts. And I'll, I'll give a bit more on that later. So when it comes to New York Times coverage of the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians, where do we stand on this hypothetical chart? The answer, I'm afraid to say, is that things aren't looking so good. Maybe we're not quite at the April 24th spike, but I think the examples I'll show in a few minutes will make the case that we're definitely in that ballpark and that the virus of advocacy journalism is very much wreaking havoc at the New York Times. I'm gonna turn this image off and continue. And, and that virus of advocacy journalism is a problem, not of course for our physical health like COVID, but the way the Times is covering, the way they're framing the Arab-Israeli conflict to fit their preferred narrative is certainly troubling in the realm of ideas. Many of you have probably heard the word meme, which today is mostly used to describe amusing little images posted on Facebook or Twitter. But originally, evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins coined the term meme, M-E-M-E, -M -E, to describe, quote, a unit of cultural transmission or imitation. Or to put it more simply, a meme is an idea that goes viral, a concept that spreads from person to person like a virus does, and that helps shape the way we collectively think of things as a culture. And when it comes to spreading ideas about politics and international affairs, the New York Times is a very significant patient zero, one that I'd say sneezes a lot and doesn't wash its hands. And that it's also a patient zero that spreads simplistic memes about Israeli malfeasance and Palestinian innocence. And I don't want to oversell them. In this overall climate of media distrust, actually only 35% of Americans and the narrowest majority of Democrats say that they trust the New York Times, which obviously wouldn't be a good approval rating if you were running for office, but we're still talking about 100 million Americans who trust the newspaper. And as Ricky suggested, their influence goes beyond that because the Times helps shape the way other media outlets, which often have a higher trust rating, the way they cover the news. And ultimately, we can distrust as much as we want. The truth is, if nobody covers certain types of news, like 
the news that Palestinian leader Mahmoud Abbas recently said about the Jews that, quote, no one is better at falsifying history or religion than them. If nobody reports it, then regardless of trust levels, Americans won't know it happened. It's like the, that tree that fell in the forest. Point being, it does matter that we're at a low point right now when it comes to the quality of New York Times coverage. It shapes the way Americans think. The way Americans think shapes the way Americans vote and how they vote can have an influence on our foreign policy. So let me take a, the next few minutes for a quick overview of the paper's recent coverage to flesh out some of the things that Ricky hinted at and to give everyone a better sense of how the paper misleads readers by shaping the story to downplay Palestinian agency and responsible for, uh, responsibility for the conflict and to cast Israeli warts, whether real or imagined, as the entire story. And we don't have to look much further than the past few weeks for a sense of that. Only two weeks ago, for example, the newspaper's bureau chief in Jerusalem, David Halpfinger, summarized Mahmoud Abbas's role in the conflict as follows. As long as he has led the Palestinian national movement, Mr. Abbas has opposed violence and espoused negotiations with Israel. And that's just perfect because it really captures the essence of how he and his newspaper cover the Palestinian side of the conflict. And to be fair, Abbas certainly isn't as militant as his predecessor, Yasser Arafat, or as his rivals, Hamas and Islamic Jihad. He's made some peaceful statements, but he also says things like this. We will enter Jerusalem as fighters by the millions. And in fact, in that very same speech, which he made last year, and in so many other speeches, Abbas praised terrorists, insisting that Palestinian martyrs, which in this context means suicide bombers and other violent attackers, are the most sanctified. He's told Palestinians that, quote, we bless every drop of blood that has been spilled for Jerusalem. Every martyr will reach paradise and everyone wounded will be rewarded by Allah. That's not opposing violence. Maybe most concerning is that the New York Times would make such a statement about Abbas's supposed peacefulness in the very same month that an official Palestinian Authority TV station broadcast the call for Palestinians to, quote, strap on the explosive belt and to detonate it in Haifa. This wasn't aired once or twice. It appeared on four separate occasions in a couple of weeks. And I'd like to thank the uh, organization Palestinian Media Watch for translating that for us. Violence against Israelis continues still today, and this type of incitement is an essential part of the story about why. But it's missing from the pages of the New York Times, which prefers to look the other way. Now, after Cameron critiqued that Times statement about the peace-loving negotiations seeking Mahmoud Abbas, the paper received an onslaught of critical letters. Many of them pointed to Abbas's words in 2018, when after saying that he's not interested in a military conflict with the Palestinian Authority and Israel between those two, he actually gave a green light to lone wolf attacks. And I'll give you the quote straight from Abbas's mouth. We will not call for a military war with Israel. Whoever has weapons, go ahead and do it. I say this out in the open. If you have weapons, go ahead. I'm with you and I will help you. Anyone who has weapons can go ahead not peaceful. And it's come to our attention that Halpfinger, that Jerusalem bureau chief for the Times, angrily responded to these letters, defending Abbas by insisting that he was just being sarcastic, tongue in cheek, and so on. Now, I question Halpfinger's ability to judge here, in part because he doesn't speak Arabic, but Palestinians do speak Arabic. And they've heard the same leader talk without a hint of sarcasm about Palestinian fighters, entering Jerusalem. They've heard him say in all sincerity that the wave of anti-Jewish stabbings and car rammings in 2015 was, quote, a justified popular uprising. They've seen Abbas post on his own Facebook page a photo of him embracing, literally hugging and kissing, a Palestinian teen who was injured while trying to stab Israelis. So when they hear him say, go ahead and use weapons, some will go ahead. In fact, it was only three weeks after Abbas's speech that Itamar Ben Gal was stabbed to death by a Palestinian attacker. And let me bring up that one last slide to underscore that point. There he is. So 
it really takes some chutzpah to insist, as did the newspaper's man in Jerusalem, David Halpinger. It takes chutzpah to insist that it was meaningless, harmless sarcasm, when Abba said the very thing that he's communicated again and again, that he supports those who attack Israelis. But that's what the New York Times said last month. I'll turn that image off. A few weeks ago, and, and to, to sort of widen from that one example, I, what I want you guys to really know is that the, the, this, this type of thing, this apologia, is really the ongoing pattern at the newspaper. And I'll give a, an example from a few weeks ago when the newspaper covered Israel's efforts to stop the Palestinian government from sending millions of dollars to the families of convicted uh, terrorists and of suicide bombers, which uh, is called pay for slay in many people's parlance. And they wrote a story on this. And if you want to know how to frame that story in a way meant to defend these Palestinian payments that incentivize violence, look no further than the headline that the newspaper put on top of that article. Israel forbids banks to help Palestinians get stipends, period. Israel forbids banks to help Palestinians get stipends. A story about pay for slay is framed as a story about Israel disliking help or disliking stipends for plain old Palestinians. And it wasn't just the headline, the article itself likewise pushed the Palestinian narrative at the expense of the Israeli one. And this type of thing goes on and on. In recent years, the paper has referred to Hamas gunmen who were killed while planting bombs and shooting at Israelis as mere protesters, gunned down while demonstrating, as if Hamas attackers are Kent State University students. Last winter, an article about fighting between Islamic Jihad and Israel mentioned, though only momentarily, that Islamic Jihad is designated as a terror group. But by press time the next morning, that clearly irrelevant information was inexplicably scrubbed from the story. It was cut by an editor. The very next day's article about Islamic Jihad described them as a little armed group that's simply nettlesome and unruly. Worse has been said, I think, about a stray tuft of hair. But this is a group that targets and murders children and their families on buses. That is Islamic Jihad. A few, men a few months before that, the paper downplayed a Palestinian sniper attack as, quote, a violent but localized expression of Palestinian impatience with Israel's failure to alleviate dire humanitarian, humanitarian conditions in Gaza. And so there's the framing again. Palestinians aren't responsible for the sniper attack. They're impatient like a small child might be, but it's Israel's fault and Israeli failures that are said to be responsible. A day later, Halfinger descri described Hamas as a group that, quote, can express its impatience with weapons. Remember though, even though the New York Times doesn't want you to, Hamas blows up pizzerias. That's the supposed impatience. Now the best clue about the paper's worldview, I think, is in the comparative analysis. While Abbas is a hero of peace, Hamas gunmen are impatient protesters, and Islamic Jihad is a nettlesome upstart, David Halfinger's story last month about Israeli army researchers who are fighting the coronavirus insisted that these researchers are best known for pioneering cutting edge ways to kill people. So remember this, if nothing else. In the New York Times, it's IDF scientists and not jihadist terrorists who are framed as killers. The paper often tells stories like about what Israelis are supposedly best known for. For example, a previous bureau chief in Jerusalem insisted that Benjamin Netanyahu is, quote, best known for and perhaps best at speaking out in strident tones. Now, Netanyahu might not be Mr. Rogers, but the paper that incessantly uses such hyperbole about Netanyahu is the same paper that somehow avoids saying anything similar about Mahmoud Abbas, who's been busy lately making speeches promoting unhinged conspiracy theories about Jews and even blaming the Jews themselves for European anti-Semitism. That's what he said in his speech. It's the narrative. And it's a, a narrative that's so powerful that even when Mr. Netanyahu is Mr. Rogers, like when he urged families to protect their grandparents from exposure to the coronavirus, Halpinger responded by casting him as a scold. This is what Halpinger wrote on Twitter. Israel closes schools and universities, but like a scolding neighbor, Netanyahu warns not to ask older relatives to provide childcare. 
One last point of comparison and I'll move on. Let's compare two statements by the leaders of each side, again, Netanyahu and Abbas, about two American ambassadors. In 2016, when Netanyahu criticized some comments by US Ambassador Dan Shapiro as being unacceptable and incorrect, those were his descriptions, the New York Times covered the comments in a news story and slammed them in an editorial. Okay, but two years later, Abbas called Ambassador David Friedman nothing less than a son of a dog. And this time, the paper was mum. I don't need to tell you which of these comments is worse and more inflammatory. And by now, I hope I don't need to tell you what exactly the newspaper is doing here. This tendency to turn away from Palestinian agency and downplay their inflammatory actions, even while shining an incessant spotlight on the Jews of the Jewish state, shapes New York Times coverage of everything essential to understanding the conflict, of terrorism, of the denial of Israel's right to exist, of the extremist BDS movement. Coverage of all of this is designed to feature the anti-Israel point of view and downplay the country's serious concerns. So if the recent examples I just gave are symptoms, then what's the cause? Ricky already mentioned the deep roots of the newspaper's historical squeamishness with Jewish concerns. And layered on top of that institutional memory is a contemporary mindset. And I don't want you to take this from me. Consider instead what New York Times insiders have said about this. A few years back, for example, the newspaper's public editor, Arthur Brisbane, wrote that his newspaper has a pervasive political and cultural worldview, which he said, virtually bleeds through the fabric of the times. He continued that certain topics seem almost to erupt in the times, overloved and undermanaged, more like causes than new subjects. That's his quote. Another Times public editor, Margaret Sullivan, used that same word referring to a worldview that she said underlies the paper's coverage. Michael Sipley, who was a Times editor and journalist for about a decade, recently referred to a narrative to which Times reporters are expected to conform. I'll quote, by and large, she wrote, Talented reporters scrambled to match stories with what internally was often called the narrative. They were expected to generate stories that fit the pre-designated line. And lastly, a former Times journalist named Ari Goldman, who's now a professor of journalism at the Columbia School of Journalism, recently recounted how his own reporting as a kid, as a young reporter on the Crown Heights riots, an anti-Jewish pogrom in Jerusalem, in Brooklyn, excuse me, was turned into a fake story about symmetrical tit-for-tat clashes between Jews and their neighbors. He condemned his editors who he said changed the story because they had settled on a frame that they forced the story through. But the frame was inaccurate, driven by an institutional slant. So Times insiders themselves have referred to a worldview, a narrative, or a frame at their paper. And when it comes to the Israeli-Arab conflict, the record clearly shows such a narrative. Margaret Sullivan, one of those public editors who I uh, quoted referencing a worldview, has even felt the need to publicly remind her fellow Times journalists that Palestinians are, quote, more than just victims. And I think that reminder tells you all you need to know. This is serious stuff. The newspaper's bias isn't the type of thing that's gonna disappear with the summer heat. And so, like with the coronavirus, we need to manage it, to contain it full time, with a full staff, and without fatigue. Close media monitoring and continuous behind the scenes exchanges with editors are like the face masks, the social distancing, the disinfectant on the doorknob. They might not eradicate the problem, but they keep it from growing unchecked. Ricky gave an example earlier of how we contained misreporting of UN Resolution 242. And in my last half minute here, I'll close with a final example of why it's important to devote all of our energy and resources to this battle. The New York Times very recently started telling readers that Area C of the West Bank, which is where the settlements are located, is land that formally belongs to the Palestinians. Palestinian land, they've said again and again. And we pointed out to editors that this isn't a fact and, and reminded them that when the paper is described territorial disputes in Western Sahara, in Kashmir, in the Scarborough Shoal, the Spratly Islands, the Yirga Triangle, and Bartica, and beyond, they wrote about disputed land. Well, the West Bank is very much disputed too. 
And so last month, our contacts with the paper led to a correction to that partisan language, twice, once on the news side and once on the opinion side. And we, we were just informed that editors are meeting to work out a better way to refer to the territory, hopefully so that it's accurate and consistent once and for all. And I just wanna point out that this is a big deal because it's absolutely vital that Americans not be fed the facile story that this conflict is about land stolen from its rightful owners which by extension could only be made right by Israel unilaterally leaving its holy places and turning them over to what would inevitably be Hamas. Americans need to understand instead that this is about disputed claims, which the parties themselves have to sort out. And so it's great news that we've managed to get even this newspaper to move in the right direction on that. And that again is hopefully a, another example that can underscore why we all have to stay engaged with this long, tiring, but fruitful battle. And with that, I'll wrap it up and wish for a healthier press and for good health to you all as well. Now we'll go over to a Q&A with Andrea and we'll hopefully have time to take as many of your questions as we can. Thank you again. Thank you, Gilad. Thank you, Ricky. And we are, I'm told that we are up over a thousand people. So this is kind of remarkable. And again, it really, it really, tells you how powerful this, this subject is for so many people. And of course, we naturally have many questions. I'm trying to consolidate a few and uh, to get to as many as we possibly can. They fall into a few categories. Um, there are a number of questions about how do, how do editors respond, or having to do with the editors. One goes to the question, is this just a question of anti-Semitism? Are we talking about anti-Semitic people that we're contending with? So that's, that is one aspect of it. And then a separate element having to do with the editors. And, and, and it should be understood that Gilad and Ricky and others in our senior staff deal very uh, systematically and regularly with the, the senior people. So the question is, what, what is their reaction? What, how do they respond to our interaction? So one is this question, are we just dealing with the problem of anti-Semitism? And then breaking that down a little, how do they respond to us? So one of you, would Ricky, do you want to take I'll, the anti-Semitism question? Part. Yes, I'll yes. start with the anti-Semitism. Um, well, I wouldn't uh, presume to call anybody an anti-Semite there. I don't know what uh, motivates them, but as we saw with the uh, cartoon, um, when, when you have constant and pervasive anti-Zionist, anti-Israel reporting, then the, the line blurs. The editors don't even recognize anti-Semitism when they see it anymore. They, it's just, it's, it's become so common, it becomes mainstreamed. Anti-Zionism is mainstream then, and, and when you hear this over and over again, it's just, people can't distinguish between anti-Semitism and, uh, and, and anti-Zionism anymore. It's just, it becomes very, very acceptable to express even anti, you know, if you allow these anti-Semitic views to be ex expressed and allow this anti-Zionism to become so pervasive that it's, considered acceptable, people don't even uh, recognize the difference anymore. And uh, Yeah, I can yes. jump in on the second half of that question yeah. uh, as to how, how editors respond. And I think obviously the answer is it depends on which editors. Um, some have a sort of reflexively defensive uh, a reaction, a, a type of smug reaction. Uh, Fred Friendly, who is a giant of journalism from a bygone era, once described his colleagues in general. Uh, uh, he said, journalists don't have thin skin, they have no skin at all. And that does apply to some. Um, others are, are, you know, notably very, very conscious of their code of ethics and that particular code of ethics that calls for accountability to the public and are a pleasure to work with. They give a, a fair listen. Sometimes they agree, sometimes they disagree. Sometimes we disagree with their disagreement, but they're, they're certainly open to criticism and understand that this is their job ultimately. I, I sometimes, when I think to myself about it, I sometimes compare journalism, journalists in journalism, which is an essential role uh, in any democracy 
to, for example, the police, which we rely on and we need. There are effective, good policemen who understand what their job actually is. There are ones who will take the power that they have and abuse it. I guess it's an apt uh, analogy nowadays. And the same thing, of course, applies to journalism because we're talking about humans after all. Some people sort of remember their place in the, in the whole fabric of our society, remember what their duties are, what their obligations are and their responsibilities. And some people understand that they have a lot of power to, to shape, to ignore, to use their uh, pen as a bully pulpit and are not so receptive. So, so we get a little bit of each um, within the New York Times and across the entire journalistic landscape. So oh, a couple of others that relate to so the, the environment generally, the, the journalistic environment, uh, a question asked compared to other papers, the Washington Post, the LA Times, um, how would it stack up? They're, 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 number one, I guess, in the current coverage, um, and that's a, certainly a broad question, but, and also historically, is there anything any counterpart in terms of, Ricky, what you've described, which is a very deep, uh, sort of a very deep, complicated relationship with, with Judaism and with the Jewish state, is there anything, any counterpart in that sort of complicated, uh, uh, apparently emotional con uh, thing in, in any other newspaper? Is there anything that, is this unique uh, to, to the New York Times? Uh, that, that, that aspect, and then just generally, how do we compare? How does, how does the New York Times stack up uh, qualitatively with other newspapers? I'll feel the, I'll feel the second half of that, uh, yeah. because it sort of ties into the, to the chart that I put up, right? We have uh, different times where it stacks up differently. It's almost like the Milankovitch cycles when you're studying climate. There are different forces at different newspapers. Some are going up, some are going down at various times. So almost like a juggling act, right? Sometimes the New York Times, there has been a time in the past where Andrea, you yourself have called the New York Times the gold standard. This was a while ago now. Right, the gold that was standard thrown back at me. <laughs> yes, uh, <laughs> when it comes to coverage. Now, absolutely not. And so as that newspaper improves and gets worse, the Washington Post might get worse and improve. So it's really a moment of the timing. Um, and I can't speak as in depth about the, the Washington Post or LA Times. But I do, like I suggested, I do think that we're at a particular low point at the moment with the New York Times. And I do think that the New York Times is unique in this, historically, I think it is unique. First of all, because it, first, it's, it's uh, so old, it's 120, I mean, since Adolf Fox bought it, it's more than 120, it's 107, you know, more than 120 years old, but it's, it's so, it has been so influential for so long. Um, the other newspapers, I don't think stack up to it in terms of its influence. Um, and, and they also don't have that same unique history, that, 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 that unease, that discomfort with um, uh, Jewish nationhood and, and uh, the Jewish state. I think the others, as Gilad just pointed out, the others may, you know, may have partisan reporting or bias, and that varies according to the time. And, and, uh, but I don't think it's as um, entrenched and embedded as the New York Times is a unique, uh, I think it's a unique uh, uh, media outlet. Right. Uh, the, a couple of other uh, good questions. Uh, one, this is right in, in uh, the kind of thing we like to answer. Do corrections really have an impact on readers given that they're tucked in small type and seldom read locations in the paper? We get this question all the time. So would anyone like to take that? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, mean I, or you could take or you. you well, take I, I would just I would just reference, uh, I, I think the anecdote that Ricky told that's so important, uh, which is that in the year 2000, when three times the New York Times had to correct this 242 error, they did that. They convened their edit, their their staff and said, "We've got to stop this," and it's had a dramatic impact. Twenty years later, they haven't done it again, and we have done similar things with other with other corrections. Now that was not visible to the individual reader. 
So the impact of that correction is not on the reader of the paper who reads it. I mean, some people would read it and, and realize it's significant. The impact is internal in the institution and it has to do with, with altering how the, the reporting occurs, with having a forward impact in how that story is, is told. So that is the deep, and that's why our focus is so, a major part of our focus is on getting the facts straight because we know that 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 the the total depiction of the story flows from the facts and um, and holding them accountable on on that score is not it's not measured by how that little correction looks so um, that that's that's very important to know um, it also the, also the oh sorry go ahead go ahead go ahead I was also saying that the historical record, it, it, it has an impact on the historical record. Right, so in That's a sense, right. if it has a medium impact on readers, it still has a large impact on uh, journalists themselves and on future researchers. Yeah. That's right. Because today, um, the, 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 this, these, these assertions and reports live forever online. They're not tossed out the way they used to be. Uh, with the newspaper, they they are they have a permanent life, so it's all the more all the more important. Um, there was a question here about um, the uh, well one one question I think is on people's minds. And this always happens when we talk about this problem, and that is always what what to do. And of course, we're talking about what we feel should be done, but one one. Uh, suggestion or one question was have boycotts worked is it worth boycotting a, a newspaper such as this so um, this is not something we have felt was was uh, a you know this wasn't something that we felt we would be undertaking we don't we we want to we want this institution to serve our country to serve our our, our democracy uh, so we want it. We want it to change and improve. Um, I don't think that a few thousand people boycotting the paper will will cause any any harm. So anybody. And else that, that numbers it? point is actually a, a very important point because ultimately, when it comes down to it, brass tacks, there are only so many Jews in America. For example, just today you have uh, talk of a bunch of people who are outraged over the opinion pages uh, decision to run a op-ed by. Senator Cotton, and there's a lot of talk of boycott. There's, you know, people are leaking uh, ch internal chats that say, oh, we've had 72 cancellations in the past hour or whatnot. And so ultimately, I don't know that we want to try to play a numbers punishment game with this. We really have uh -huh. to appeal to their sense of what they have promised to what journalism should be. Because if we sort of shine the spotlight on their, their shortcomings and, and make them put their money where their mouth is when it comes to not only their codes of ethics from, from years ago, but these, these are promises that are repeated year after year by the, the publishers. So mm -hmm. we have to appeal to their better uh, senses. We're, we're not, you know, we, we don't have a very blunt tool to force them to do whatever they want. And when I say we, I mean we as, as the, the you know, population that's concerned whatsoever with the Middle East, the Jewish people, whatever it is, we, we're, we only count for so many numerically. So we have to appeal with arguments, I think. Mm -hmm. um, this is an interesting question. Um, there are so many here. I'm sorry, if I, we won't be able to get to all of them, but there are lot, lots of great questions. Um, this one asks, what the record of the New York Times is on reporting racial, racist treatment of minorities uh, in the Middle East, uh, besides the treatment of Jews and Israel, how about the Kurds and Christians and Druze and Baha'is and Baluchis, Yazidis, and so on? Um, basically, other, you know, what about the mistreatment of minorities in the Middle East, sort of proportionally? So, for the most part, what minorities uh, in the pages of the New York Times, and there are exceptions, the Yazidi, of course, the, the treatment at the hands of ISIS was so striking that this did become a front page type of situation. But for the most part, the Baha'i in, in Iran are, and I'm, I'm not as much of a, a expert on this, but as far as I can tell when I read their coverage of Iran, and certainly relative to the frequency of, of criticism of Israel in, in that coverage, the Baha'i mm -hmm. are almost non-existent, I think. Right. They have 
they, the, the, the fact is that they have, the New York Times has an obsessive interest uh, with Israel. It's, it's, it's obsessively interested and, and it covers Israel obsessively. So I don't think that it uh, pays as much attention. I mean, it may report, uh, you know, report it a bit, but it's, it's not the same obsessive uh, uh, obsession that it has with Israel. This is a, a, an interesting question. Um, do do the, sort of does the pro Arab side, the pro Palestinian side, have a lot of complaints about the New York Times? I don't know. The uh, I'm not sure we uh, have a measurement for that. Well, I know that that, that some we don't know uh, whether they what complaints they get, but we know that some editors, when in, in trying to defend themselves, always say, well, if we, we, get, uh, re, we get complaints from the pro-Palestinian side too, so if we get complaints from the uh, from right. pro-Israel and from- From both sides. Yes, it balances out. They right. say we must be doing something right if we get complaints from both sides. That's right. And to be fair, not all have said that. I've definitely heard plenty of journalists look right through that uh, you know, nonsensical formulation and say, well, that's actually not true. So right. some recognize that, but we have heard that all too many times. Uh, a question about letters. Uh, someone's asking how fair is the selection of letters to the editor? Um, I don't know that we have insight on on the, the fairness in totality, I know that we do many, many, many of our letter writers are published there. Uh, just the other day, I think it was a couple of days ago, Dor Doron Lubinsky, I mentioned his name, one of our letter writers of the year, um, was published and, and we cannot sort of overstate how significant it is. This is a way to reach potentially millions of readers. So um, whether they're fair or not, many of our letter writers do get published. Um, and it is a matter of numbers and, and one has to keep, keep pressing ahead. Um, let us see. Uh, somebody's asked if there's any other organization like camera. Anyone want to jump in on that? I don't think there's any organization that has this level of, of staff, the, the, the numbers of staff, the, the resources to really publish the study that Ricky had mentioned earlier, which was line by line of six months of coverage. Um, no, no one else has done that at all. I, I don't think anyone else can do that. And we're really um, leading the way, not, not only because we're the oldest uh, founded in 82, but because we're seeing that, that you know, people are watching our successes and even trying to emulate what we're doing. Um, a question here is asking whether Brett Stevens has had any influence at the New York Times. Any thoughts on that? He certainly, he certainly came forward with a powerful uh, column when the, the uh, cartoon ran. Um, yeah, that, that column, uh, it, it's notable and noticed when a columnist criticizes his own newspaper. Right. Um, so, so that can't but have an influence. I can say that I've spoken, and this is not about the New York Times, I've spoken to a columnist at a different prominent newspaper in the ilk of the New York Times who, who had come over from um, another paper and, and was a columnist. And, and you know, he, I didn't get the sense when I was speaking to him casually that, that he felt that he had a, a great influence there. It, it's it's the, the institutional culture, the culture there is, is so entrenched and so vast that one person can only do uh, so much, you know, hopefully and, people have his ear, but. And they've, they've always had um, some, some pro-Israel columnists, they had A.M. Rosenthal, uh, you know, they've always tried to show their balance by having at least one columnist uh, who, um, you know, presents a, an alternate point of view, but um, that hasn't seemed to have changed the, overall uh, mindset. Oh, one of, uh, we have a question here asking if camera still has that great sign outside the New York Times office in Times Square. Uh, we don't currently. Um, it's really not a time to put up a great big billboard. If you all remember, this was a three-story billboard that actually faced the newsroom of the New York Times, um, which we had 
we had uh, sort of posted there on multiple occasions when things went badly at the times, we would just put up another another billboard. Um, at the moment, of course, there are no pedestrians. In normal times, 100,000 people are walking by. And in normal times, there are people inside that building. So right now is not, is not the time for that. Um, but uh, uh, it's not something we would um, rule out down the road. It is one of the ways that we address uh, what, that we speak to them, we make clear that we're not happy. There was a, one point at which we had billboards all around the greater metropolitan area. Um, so I guess we have time for just a couple more. Um, let's see. This is the this is the the question of questions, and I, I guess we. We're repeating ourselves, but I think we should say, answer it again. What can an average American do uh, to 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 help fix the situation? Um, the the either of you? Well, I'd, oh, I'd they, say go on, Ricky, please. I just say let your voice be heard. I mean, write letters to the editor. Let your voice be heard. We saw with the anti-Semitic cartoon that was published last year, that it was only because there was such a chorus of voices that they did back down, they did recognize, uh, they did apologize, they did uh, promise not to, uh, to, to, to change things procedurally so that something like that wouldn't happen again. So when the voices, the more voices speak out against the bias, the, the more influence uh, we have. And the plus side is today we have more ways of communicating with the journalists than we've ever had before. You don't need to make a trip to the post office. Uh, you don't need a stamp. We have Twitter. We have email addresses everywhere. Um, so, so we have ways of, of making our voice heard that, that we didn't used to have. So definitely uh, avail yourself of those. Well, I think uh, this is a discussion that could go on much longer, but we will, we've come to uh, past an hour uh, and we probably should close now. There was much more that we could we could talk about, and we had many questions. Um, but I want to thank all of you for joining us and for being part of this absolutely vital work in fighting against the sickness of lies about Israel. Gilad's analogy is perfect. What we at do is the analog of what doctors and hospitals and medicine do that keep a lot of disease at bay and improve, improve our physical health. We fight the viruses of lies and defamation that attack the hearts and minds of people. And we have to do it as systematically and relentlessly as the scientists who battle disease. Our medicine is truth applied continuously like fighting any disease. Our work entail, entails stamina and fortitude this is a very long, long struggle. All of you are part of that effort and we could not do it without you. We thank you and we urge you to continue to support us. As we say in these virtual gatherings, we look forward to the real in-person meetings that will come at some point in the time ahead. So thank you again for joining us. Have a great evening and we'll see you next time.